The doctor comes on like and asks me, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how bad is your pain? And I said eight. He decided to go ahead and give me 0.5 milligrams of morphine, which is basically water, you know, while I was having a crisis. That night, I ended up in the ICU. Hi, my name is Zura Abdullahi, and I live with sickle cell disease. Living with sickle cell disease is living with pain, overcoming many adversities because you get so much strength from having to start over and over again in your life. And I could go to the ER like this and say I'm in pain because I have pain right now in my hip. But someone could look at me and be like, that's not, you know, that's not pain. You don't look like you're in pain. I've never had problems with, say, my hips and joints till now that I'm, I'm 36 now. Uh, my whole life, I've never had problems with that. I've had problems with um, uh, breathing, you know, my lungs, my joints. Sometimes when I'm in crises, I feel that. I have had a stroke before, like a minor, they call it a TIA. I didn't even know I had it uh, until I saw the brain scan and that was lucky. I've had PEs, pulmonary embolisms. I've had one embolism in each lung, like one blood clot in each lung. So that was scary, you know, so we just go through a lot. My name is Dr. Tartania Brown. I am a senior palliative care physician with MDHS Hospice and Palliative Care. I also have sickle cell anemia. So I was actually a patient before I was a physician. And being a patient and living that life constantly is humbling and always reminds me to take care of the people the way that I want to be taken care of. Sickle cell disease is a disorder that affects people with genetic links to the African diaspora. So specifically people that are from African continent, India, Middle East, uh, Greek, Mediterranean, South American, Central America, and the Americas, the Caribbean. Sickle cell disease affects the red blood cells. And the red blood cells are the workhorse of the body. They carry the oxygen all throughout the body. And most red blood cells or people's red blood cells look like donuts, where my red blood cells look like bananas. So think about a donut. It's nice and round and there's a hole in the middle. The hole in the middle is where the oxygen goes. So as the red blood cell rolls around the body, it gives off the oxygen and it picks up carbon dioxide. But a banana, it's not rolling so well the way a donut would roll. It also doesn't have a nice hole in the center. So it doesn't carry oxygen the way a donut can carry it. So persons with sickle cell disease have anemia because they don't have the same amount of oxygen that a person without sickle cell does. The other thing is a banana has points on the end. So those points can get stuck as it's rolling around the body. As it gets stuck, it causes blockages. And those blockages is what causes pain. And that way, persons with sickle cell disease have pain as the hallmark of it, but they can also have other complications. And because red blood cells go all throughout the body, they can have complications anywhere in the body from head to toe. Pain is an interesting thing. And being a pain doctor, I really can say that there's lots of different types of pain. But pain, it's also one where the body makes you forget because it can be so painful. And I will talk about what pain feels like for me living with sickle cell disease. I would say it's nothing like what the movies describe it. The movies like to show someone screaming or wailing, but for me, my pain can be so severe that it takes away my breath. It takes away my ability to breathe, to move, to think or to function. The pain is so intense that I I'm like a rock, I just don't move because exerting any additional energy is beyond my capacity. The hip pain I had, I had last night, it's just throbbing, constant throbbing. I mean, it just doesn't stop. If I have a, a crisis in my back, it's the same thing. I would um, describe it as, you know, when you hit, when you close your thumb on the door, 
Yeah, so that, imagine the pain there. That's what I feel in my joints and wherever it is I feel pain. I'm a chef, so I love to cook. I would say the way tickles are affected that is when I was in culinary school, I could not stand the kitchen, like the heat. Uh, I remember passing out twice uh, and being, basically being uh, wheeled out, you know, in a, in a, they had to call the ambulance. I couldn't breathe. So that, and that's when I realized I couldn't work in a kitchen anymore. And I had to figure out my own stuff um, and do it on my own. So I have control over my time. So some of the medications I've been on is Andari, which is like a, a powder form. You just put it in water and it, you know, you drink it. It's supposed to decrease the amount of times you have a crisis every year. Blood transfusions, I've had blood exchanges. I tried to get a bone marrow transplant and it didn't work out. I lost both donors and then I was also <laughs> a little bit scared at the time. So I couldn't, I couldn't use a sibling donor because I have a sibling that has sickle cell and the others don't match. Yeah, so now I'm just looking into doing gene editing, but I'm not sure yet whether or not I, I'm going to do it still. <laughs> gene editing, so they go, there's something called CRISPR and it's something that isolates the gene. So they can literally go in there and take off the sickle cell gene, but you don't know what else it'll affect. So I don't know, it's, it's fairly new. Everybody just thinks, oh, there's this cure. So yeah, why don't you just go do it? You forget that the patient also has mental stuff to think about, you know, their chances of it working, the stuff they're gonna go through. Uh, so, so many things, you know, there are some patients that just can't live life, you know, so for those patients is, you know, it's, it's not even a choice, but I feel like I've had, you know, I've had times where I'm just okay and I'm able to do stuff, you know, grad school was the last thing I did and it was, you know, one of the hardest things I've ever done because of the deadlines and, you know, no flexibility. So those are the kind of things that need to be addressed um, in terms of advocacy and uh, diversity and inclusion when it comes to sickle cell and, you know, other chronic illnesses, not just sickle cell. Proper care for sickle cell disease needs to be comprehensive care. But comprehensive care is not just looking and managing disease, the pain of the disease, nor is it just managing the complications of the disease. Comprehensive care is also managing the psychological effects of the disease, the spiritual effects of the disease. So comprehensive care truly needs to be mind, body, and spirit. It is not just managing it in one way. We got to look at all avenues. Don't do an EKG just to confirm well, we're not dying and then have us sit and wait for you. You know, it's, uh, it, that's very painful, you know, because it's a matter of time. If you don't treat the pain right away, it gets worse and then it gets harder to control. I really want to see, like in every hospital in America, I want to see a standardized treatment for people that come in with a crisis. Um, see us within 30 minutes of us being there. The good thing is I've started seeing a little, you know, some changes here and there, uh, especially in the last two years, like in the ER. Some of the doctors are aware of it, but I've heard other sickle cell patients say they have their doctor Googling what is sickle cell by their bedside. Sickle cell is the microcosm of the social inequities that exist in medicine. It literally is a, a poster child of the racial inequities, the socioeconomic inequities, the geographic inequities, financial inequities, all tied in to this one disease. And then when we add on the intersections of age, of race, of, of color, you really get to see 
a lot of the profound problems that we're all dealing and addressing in this one disease. A recent study came out that was looking at um, electronic health records. And I believe the study looked at 40,000 cases and it showed that persons of black or African-American descent had two and a half times more negative comments in their electronic health record. Just the electronic health record. And then persons with sickle cell disease had even higher numbers than that. It shows that there's just a, a bias that, that, that exists. There, people would say things like, in quotations, they, they call it the severest pain they have. But why would it need to be in quotations? It could be the severest pain they have. And not having trust and belief on either side, from the patient to the doctor or the doctor to the patient, causes a true breakdown in communication and a true breakdown in, in care. I'll tell you a story about one of my hospital stays. Um, I got to the ER, got the EKG, everything was fine. I got uh, a bed. And the doctor comes on like and asks me, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how bad is your pain? And I said eight. Next thing, she asks, what medicine do, usually works for your pain? What happened was she listened to me, and then she went to my. She didn't even read my chart, obviously, because if she had read my chart, she would see that my doctor already has a protocol for me, um, but that wasn't done. Um, she decided to go ahead and give me 0.5 milligrams of morphine, which is basically water, you know, while I was having a crisis. I'm sitting here in pain and then she's just giving me nothing. And then for some reason, my doctor goes on the computer and she checks whether or not I'm in the ER because she's the one that sent me there. And she's, she saw what she was giving me. She had to call the ER and be like, this is crazy, you know. She's her chest is hurting. Uh, oxygen level is low. She just left my office, and you're here trying to discharge her after giving her 0.5 milligrams of morphine three times. You know, you want to discharge her? No, you know. That night, I ended up in the ICU. I had acute chest syndrome. Acute chest syndrome is the leading cause of death um, for people with sickle cell. The main thing I'd like to debunk about living with sickle cell disease is that persons with sickle cell disease are not trying out for an Academy Award in pain. <laughs> I, and what I mean by that is patients are not acting. They're not trying to gain or something from you or, you know, game the system. They're really just asking for help and support, and they just want to be believed. They truly are living their day-to-day -day life, and unfortunately, part of their day-to-day -day life is interacting with the medical world. But once they leave the medical world, they truly do want to go back into the world and live their day-to-day -day life. And it's our duty in the medical world to help our patients get back to their lives as best as they can. So another thing, for people with sickle cell to know is that it's very important to have mentorship uh, and also for parents to know that you have to um, expose your child to almost everything so that they know earlier what they like to do and make it into a job you know and they have to understand that they have to have something that they have control over their time if they want to be um, really comfortable later. For me, going to um, <laughs> culinary school and deciding to be a chef uh, was one decision that I wasn't really thinking about. Like, I didn't connect that to my body. I just thought, oh, this is what I love. I'm going to go do it. I did not think it was going to be different from someone else, you know, and that as I went in there, I realized, you know, you really have to think about what you're doing before. So I just went and had a, got a master's in food studies. And now I'm trying to transition to something that I could do at home. You can achieve your goals and your dreams. You just have to do it in a very creative way.